As I said, we're going to have a presentation now on lithium, lithium supply and demand outlook, bubble or secular bull market. And to tell you all about it, we're delighted to welcome from CRU Group, their consultant there and specialist on the lithium sector, Alice Yu. So Alice, please. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Leo, it's gone already, uh, for the intro, oh, he's here. thank you Leo for the introduction. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about the lithium market. Um, the title of my presentation is Lithium Market, a Continued Played Out. Um, everyone might have heard things on the lithium market, um, but the title of my presentation will become um, more apparent as I go through it. Oh, this is the legal notice we have to put in to say you need to observe the confidentiality. Um, a bit about CRU for those who don't know. We look at metals and mining research and it's a company headquartered in London. Uh, we've recently opened an office in Singapore and we are also present in Sydney, Japan, Beijing and Shanghai. So the content of my presentation, I'll cover uh, five main parts. One is um, to give you an overview of the supply methodology. So uh, to show you that we take care with our forecast and then to give you our forecast for 2017. Uh, to give you an overview of the lithium market in 2017. And then I'm going to talk about um, aspects of demand and supply. Um, key evolvements and key takeaways. Um, finishing off with um, long-term agreements between automakers and uh, lithium producers um, that have continued to evolve. So firstly, uh, the slide is quite complex, but um, to do our, uh, so CRU looks at our lithium forecast and the key component of that is the EV forecast. Uh, we are quite diligent with how we do that. So we do it bottom up on a regional basis. So firstly, we work out total auto ownership based on GDP per capita and um, population. And then we work out the annual vehicle sales. From that, we'll say a certain percentage of that will be EVs based on the total cost of ownership, which includes um, purchase cost, maintenance cost, and scrappage cost. And all the government policies that, that encourage uptake through, um, uh, through subsidies will account for in, in the total cost of ownership. And um, through that, we come up with our EV forecast. And, and then that will drive the lithium demand in EVs. For our demand side, uh, we look at uh, or operating projects, then we try to capture a world of um, uh, or projects under development. And then we will classify those projects. Um, someone mentioned to me today that uh, only a proportion of projects or planned capacity expansions have come into realization. And that is quite evident in, in lithium, but also from CRU's experiences with other commodities. Um, so based on the project classification that's uh, committed, possible, speculative, probable, we'll slap on a percentage. So for each, for all projects uh, and their volumes under a certain category, only a proportion of that we, we bring it to the market and include it in the supply forecast. So the market going forward, um, on the whole, we think uh, supply growth will outstrip demand growth to 2025 um, because the total growth rate in supply is just a bit higher than demand. The market was relatively balanced last year and we expect the market to be relatively balanced this year. Um, in terms of price levels, because we've seen sustained market shortages, prices have increased 
so that every operation today is making a lot of money and prices have been high to encourage new entries. Going forward, as we think the market will move towards uh, a state of relative surplus, especially uh, in the nearer term to 2022, we think the surplus will peak um, at around 80,000 tons of lithium carbon equivalent. So around two or three projects, more than what the market needs. Um, towards 2025, we think um, market will retain uh, return to relative balance because um, demand growth outstrips supply. So hence our price forecast expect some rationalization in prices as it returns to some kind of normality where not every project uh, being planned will come into production and only those the most cost competitive um, will do. So hence for the shape of our cost, uh, of our price forecast. Um, going towards 2025, as the market begins to balance again, um, it would have a tail that's sliding up. So that's um, the ballpark of our forecast. Um, I think the whole uh, forecast does hide away uh, bright spots or things that you have to consider in the lithium market. As, as it's uh, a speciality chemicals market, effectively. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about, um, both on the demand side and the supply side, things that you have to watch out for, and uh, for, for miners developing projects and for investors, these are maybe the key takeaways to have. Um, so firstly, on the demand side, um, uh, we think the global EV demand will increase to around 13 million units per year by 2025. If you look at the growth rate in terms of CAGR uh, for both uh, EV production and uh, global uh, lithium demand in EVs, the growth rate is slightly higher in the medium term, so over the next five years than the medium to long term. But this hides the fact that um, over the longer term, you're growing at a higher base. So actually in volume terms, the average uh, volume, uh, the average additional uh, number of vehicles sold each year, that figure will be larger over the medium to longer term than over the nearer term. So around 1.5, additional units of EVs will be sold in between 2022 to 2025 compared to just 1.1 million units between 2017 and 2022. And this is also similar in when translating into lithium demand uh, in EVs, that the growth rate will be higher in the medium term but the, addi the additions in terms of volumes will be larger over the long term. The second thing is that policy support to encouraging EV uh, sales and uptake is, uh, encourages, encourages more battery electric vehicles over other types of EVs. Now, battery electric vehicles have higher energy density requirements so they need more kilowatt hours of energy per vehicle. So they need a bigger battery and hence more lithium. Um, so that's another factor to consider when, when looking at um, how lithium is used in EVs. What's interesting, um, and we've seen in the past year, that in China, um, apart from conventional mar um, entrance to the EV market, we are also seeing tech giants entering into the market. So the so-called BAT, so Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, they are either forming JVs with uh, existing automakers, or they are investing in new, um, new EV companies. For example, Alibaba is investing in Xiaopeng, um, and Tencent is investing in a company called Weilai, um, 
and also Tencent and the Guangzhou Auto Corporation Group, which is a traditional automaker. They've also have a collaboration. It's believed that the tech giants have a slight different angle to the investment in EVs. So as a traditional automaker, they're more interested in keeping their market share, developing the model for the future. For the tech giants, maybe the angle is to uh, develop the electronic system used in cars, or to develop automated driving, or other servicing platforms uh, for passenger vehicles of the future. Regardless, new capital, especially from the tech giants, enforces the fact that uh, EVs are the vehicles of the future. Um, moving on to supply, this is, I quite like this chart because I put it together. Um, but, but the chart shows the different uh, time needed at each stage of the um, lithium chain. Um, so the different amount of times for plants to um, enter into production. And you can see, so this covers mine, conversion facility, precursor and cathode, battery makers and car makers. And you can see the time to market is skewed at both ends. So it takes the longest amount of time to, uh, to develop an asset. And it also takes a long time to design a, a vehicle mode uh, or a vehicle type. So it takes about eight to 10 years to develop a vehicle for automakers. And the point is, despite the overall picture you're seeing with the market balance, there's potential for bottlenecks or gluts to occur at any point of the stage in the value chain. So what we've seen in the past is there hasn't been enough mine capacity. Then what we could see in the future is that um, lithium chemical producers may not be able to produce the right chemicals uh, for, for cathodes and battery makers. It's also possible that the battery makers can't, dis can't produce the right batteries for the co car makers or, they, or, or the whole system, the battery system they, they design have some problems with it, and so on. Um, an example with gluts in, in mine supply is that um, last year, uh, an Australian mine, Wajina, um, supplied the market with spodumene DSOs. Typically, the Australians supply the market with spodumene concentrate, but this mine decided to sell DSOs to raise early stage financing. The, the pro so they dug the stuff out of the ground, they shipped it to China, and then China couldn't process all of that to the right lithium product to be used in, down in the downstream value chain. So although the product has been dug out of the ground, it's been sitting around and waiting to enter into this chain. The next point I want to highlight is that, um, as you know, there are two types of lithium assets. There are brines and there are hard rock. And there are two common types of lithium chemicals that you, you might have heard. So that's lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide. Um, more commonly, um, brines have a cost advantage over hard rock in the production of lithium carbonate. But this cost advantage phase in the production of lithium hydroxide. And you can see in 2017, around 61% of lithium carbonate capacity is designed to use brine as the raw material, but only 34% of the hydroxide capacity uses the brine as the raw material. So the question is, how can the market ensure that the right lithium raw material will be available for processing into the right lithium chemicals. In general, if a plant is designed to have brine um, as the lithium feedstock, then it can only use brine. If the plant is designed to use um, hard rock, then you can only use hard rock. And it's very difficult to change. So, it's possible that we might see a two-tiered market uh, with brines being 
more readily produced into carbonate and for hard rock deposits being more readily produced into hydroxide. Even despite this, um, you, you have to think uh, if, if a question comes to you saying, oh, we have a lot of lithium carbonate capacity more than what demand is, then you have to ask yourself, does these capacities have the right uh, quantities and qualities of raw material? If not, then the production utilization on, on those cap capacities will be very low and there might be a shortage on the um, lithium chemicals market. Um, the other thing I want to draw attention to is the market share of the big five, the so-called big five in the lithium world. Um, so uh, it's raised a lot of attention recently because of uh, a deal that's gone through, but I'll explain it from the start. Um, so the lithium market is dominated by the so-called big five, so Albemarle, SQM, Tianqi, Ganfeng, and FMC. And a lot of these companies have seen plans for production increases. Um, between 2017 and this year, total global lithium chemical conversion capacity is expected to increase by 62%. So that means for each of the big five, if they want to retain their market share, their capacity needs to increase by at least the speed of the size of the total market, which is in the increase of 62% this year. The second point is that even out of the big five, the largest company only has 18% share. And you see a large other section, which accounts for 30, a third of um, capacity, and that share is expected to grow. So my point is the lithium market is actually becoming relatively more fragmented as new entrants are coming into the market. Um, this chart also gives a good basis um, to, think, to think about the Tianqi and ISQM deal. So Tianqi has uh, recently purchased 24% of SQM. That has what worried the market of how much control does Tianqi have of the lithium market. If you look at mine charts, um, so Tianqi in 2018, they've got 12% of the market and then they've, got, they've, they've purchased 24% of SQM's 14%. So that increases their total capacity control to around 15%. But that's a very crude way of looking at it. To really understand how much TNG controls, it's, the devil is in, in the detail, and we don't know that yet. That is, how much access does TNG have to SQM's volumes, whether is helping SQMs to market their additional expansions or the direct purchase of SQMs materials. Um, and finally, I'd like to um, finish off with looking at what's been coming out in, in, in the news for, for lithium. So Albert Mouse commented that Automakers are increasingly pushing for 10-year contracts for security of supply. So today, a typical three-year contract is quite common. And so why automakers are looking for 10-year contracts is what I showed in my chat earlier, that it takes eight to 10 years to design a vehicle model. So even despite that the lithium market has, is returning to balance, there are supply coming online, it's still very important for the automakers to ensure that they will have the lithium raw material to make into the batteries that will, they will need for their car models of the future. So we've seen BMW trying to secure a 10-year supply of cobalt and lithium. Toyota has 15% uh, share of Orocobre, which is an existing Argentinian supplier. Greywater Motors in China has purchased a share in Pilbara Minerals and an offtake agreement. And Tesla has secured long term, um, has secured offtake agreement with um, the uh, old grey asset, um, jointly owned by Kidman and SQM. 
So even with the market improving, we see continued need for long-term supply to, uh, for security of materials. And within the lithium value chain, there are, um, there are pockets where the demand is st still very strong in terms of supply. It's about who can ensure their material are fed into the supply chain um, at the right time so it meets downstream demand. Um, so on that note, I'll conclude my presentation on lithium. And you're welcome to ask me any questions afterwards. Thank you.